Hello everyone. I'm going to tell you two new spy biographies tonight. And as usual, I hope you find these stories entertaining and learn a thing or two. So, our first story will be about Josephine Baker. Arguably, she is not primarily famous for being a spy, but she was one for a short time. And I wanted to tell her story because she had the most surprising and on many counts admirable life you could imagine. If you are not familiar with her name, or if Josephine Baker makes you think about an entertainer with a skirt of bananas, you're going to be surprised. Our second story will be about Sidney Rayleigh, and he was more of a professional spy. He's been called the ace of spies, and he has been credited for inspiring the James Bond character. With him, we will discover the spying game in Russia and other parts of the world at the beginning of the 20th century and how he worked for the British intelligence service. But for now, just make yourself comfortable and get ready to travel in time. As always, you can shut your eyes anytime because you don't need the visuals to follow these two stories. Listening is enough. If you wish to have this video or the audio available offline and in higher quality, they can be downloaded from my Patreon page. The link is in the description. And now, let's begin with our first story of the night. In April 1975, a funeral ceremony with military honors, followed by a huge procession, was held at the heart of Paris. Josephine Baker was on her last journey this day. And once again, it didn't go unnoticed. But why and how a black American woman, born in poverty, 68 years earlier, in Missouri, could be celebrated like this in France? We're going to explore the many lives she had as an entertainer, a war hero, an activist, a lover, a mother, and discover a truly amazing destiny. Josephine Baker was born Freda Josephine MacDonald in 1906 in St. Louis, Missouri. Her mother was African American and her father unknown. The identity of her father remains a mystery to this day. Her mother refused to the end to talk about it. She was exposed to show business from a very young age. Her mother and the man she lived with had a song and dance act and they performed wherever they could find bookings around St. Louis. She also grew up in a, a neighborhood home to many theaters and movie houses. This was in the 1910s and uh, cinema venues were expanding all across the United States in those years. Her childhood was not spent in uh, complete misery, but still the family was poor and she did not receive much uh, education. She dropped out of school 
at 12 and uh, spent most of her time in the streets playing with other children around a railroad station or around many theaters in the neighborhood. As uh, her career as a performer was not enough to make ends meet, her mother also washed laundry and at only eight Josephine was placed as a domestic, a maid, for white families in St. Louis. Placing a child to work and live with another family is something that may horrify us today and looks completely unacceptable. But it was common at the beginning of the 20th century when a poor family could not properly feed and dress their children. This was a way to at least put a roof above their head, feed them, and eventually bring in a bit of money for the rest of the family. In this position, Josephine was very poorly treated and didn't stay long with her employers. By the age of 13, she intermittently lived in the streets, sleeping in cardboard and surviving with small waitress jobs or dancing in the streets for coins. For a year, she married a man, but it quickly ended, and following her divorce, she found work with a street performance group and at just 15, she married for the second time to a Willie Baker. Even though they also divorced a few years later, she kept the name Baker because she had started to be successful as a performer with this name. One aspect of her personality appeared in these years. She was ambitious and determined to be successful as an entertainer. She badgered tirelessly a show manager until she was recruited for a vaudeville show. So what is or was a vaudeville? It was a genre of shows with separate and generally unrelated acts grouped together to entertain the audience. It could be uh, music, singers, dance, comedians, acrobats, trained animals, or even magicians. This type of shows was very uh, popular and successful in America until the 1930s, and it provided work opportunities for uh, all kinds of performers as long as they could uh, entertain a crowd. For the Ville shows, often toured the country, if they were successful enough, a bit like uh, a circus troupe. When they had the budget and uh, in venues that could uh, accommodate enough spectators to make it profitable, like uh, typically in big cities, in New York City on Broadway, for example, vaudeville shows evolved into uh, elaborate reviews and musicals. These uh, shows often had a chorus line, a large group of dancers who perform synchronized routines, and it is as a chorus girl that Josephine Baker had uh, her first public recognition as a performer. Aged just 15, and with the troupe she had uh, been able to join, she went to New York City to perform and at the beginning of the 1920s, she could join the chorus lines of successful reviews on Broadway. When she arrived in New York City, jazz and swing music were conquering the musical and entertainment scene. Jazz had originated in New Orleans decades before, but it had spread to every big city and uh, even not so big city in the United States, 
and also overseas, including to Paris, France. That would be important a bit later in Josephine Baker's career. Paris discovered jazz at the end of the First World War, when many American soldiers, including African Americans, stayed in Paris in the last year of the war and a bit after. Because it was new, because it was seen in a favorable light, the US had helped the Allies win the war, and also because many French musicians quickly embraced it, jazz became very popular in Paris, and this uh, interest in this style of music that started in the 1920s never entirely disappeared in the following decades. So there was appetite and curiosity in France, as well as in other European countries, for American musicians and performers that represented this form of modernity and entertainment. Many of them were African Americans. It doesn't mean there were no racism or prejudice in Paris, but it was quite different from America. Black people were not a part of French metropolitan society like they were a part of the American society. The wave of African immigration to France started, but uh, decades later, after the Second World War, by the 1920s or 1930s, it was very uncommon to see black people in the streets of a French city. And Africans were perceived mainly through colonial stereotypes or exotism, including quite a lot of patronizing. The thing with African Americans who came to Paris is that they didn't fit with this colonial picture. They dressed and spoke like Europeans. And as performers, they could be the center of attention. They were a novelty and they brought an entire cultural universe with them. So even though they might have faced racism sometimes in France, Overall, the public was uh, ready to embrace and celebrate them. By contrast, at the same time, it was not easy and maybe even impossible in New York City for a black performer like Josephine Baker to become a mainstream star for all audiences. Even in a city like New York City, that on many counts was more liberal than others. It was nearly impossible for a black performer to reach stardom beyond the black community or without playing along the stereotypes that most of the white audience expected to see. And Josephine Baker started her career in New York City playing along those lines. She could stand out as a chorus girl being the last dancer in the line. Her act was to perform comically, as if she didn't remember the moves, until she started to perform them perfectly, and uh, even with added complexity. She also did blackface comedy at clubs, and her mother strongly disapproved of this, because it was demeaning. But she was only 19, at the time of her breakthrough and certainly more focused on earning a living and making a name for herself than fighting racism and stereotypes. And it worked. Having gained a small fame on Broadway, mainly among professionals, she received an invitation to tour in Paris in 1925. Ambitious as she was, and eager to open new doors, very energetic too, she was only 19, she accepted and was booked to star in a rather prestigious review at a theatre near the Champs-Élysées. 
So she arrived in Paris in the context I described before. There was curiosity for American performers and beyond performers for music and art forms from America. There was, on top of this, a fashion around non-European art in general in Europe in the 1920s as a source of inspiration in decoration, especially African art. African statues or masks had very pure lines and uh, unusual proportions that made them look very conceptual. And this resonated with European artists, especially in Paris. African art was a source of inspiration for the new style in architecture and decoration called Art Deco. It inspired a lot of buildings and furniture from the 1920s and 1930s. Josephine Baker played on all of this to launch her French career. She was still very young. She debuted in France at 19 only and probably unable to grasp how her act could resonate with the audience in a country she did not even know. But she certainly was willing to do whatever it takes to seduce this new audience. And she probably had stronger intuitions about how she could sell her act. Her first show was an instant success. And the part of her act that became almost instantly iconic, at least in France at the beginning, was a segment where she appeared and danced almost naked in a skirt of bananas. That was very uh, cliché, but she brought so much energy and fun to it that the audience was impressed and adopted her. We are still very far from any uh, spying activities at this point, but the reason why she later took very serious risks for her country of adoption take roots in this period, when she felt warmly welcome and uh, she received the attention and success she had been hoping for. And that was already quite an achievement for a girl who was sleeping in the streets of St. Louis just a few years before. After her debut in Paris, Josephine Baker toured Europe and her fame grew beyond the frontiers of France. What distinguished her from other acts by young and good-looking women is that she was also embraced by artists and intellectuals. Picasso, who lived in Paris, painted her. She was friends with Jean Cocteau and uh, praised by uh, writers like Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway called her the most sensational woman anyone ever saw. She was beautiful, following the beauty standards of the 1920s, and she remained beautiful after. But beyond good looks, she had charisma, and it seems people who approached her were very often seduced. Her love life was rarely quiet in the 1920s and 1930s, with men and women alike. She could be paradoxical sometimes, because she herself lived very freely, but could also be quite conservative and uh, traditional because of her education as a child and uh, the values of the time. She always presented the public persona of a respectable married woman, and decades later, when she found out that one of her adoptive sons was gay, she expelled him from the house, even though she had had multiple relationships with women herself. She was also a hard worker, and did not rest on her early successes. Actually, in the 1930s, 
she started a transformation that completely reinvented her public persona. She took singing classes for months, she stopped nudity in her shows, and she transformed from charming dancing girl into some sort of singing diva. What she didn't have in vocal abilities, she made up with charisma and interpretation, so that she stayed on top of her game for the entire decade of the 1930s, living the life of a successful singer touring Europe. The only failure in her career in these years was when she tried returning to New York City. Her show in America was poorly received by both the public and critics. It bombed and it affected her very much. After that, she returned to Paris and decided to call France her home. She married an industrialist that was her third marriage in 1937 and she became a French citizen. Like for many French citizens, her life changed completely with the arrival of the Second World War. In 1939, she was now 33. France and the UK declared war on Germany in response to the invasion of Poland that had been guaranteed by them. Immediately, and because she had her entries in embassies and international circles, Josephine Baker was recruited by French military intelligence as a correspondent to provide any information she could about German troops. The correspondent was not really a spy in the sense that there was no fabricated cover or precisely defined missions. She was a provider of information and she took this role very seriously. For example, she was able to provide information heard at the Italian embassy in Paris without raising suspicion. In 1940, the German invasion started for real and in a few weeks, the French army was overwhelmed. This and the following years of occupation were a huge shock for the entire French population. To this day, it remains the darkest period in the history of the country, because on top of defeat, a small but not insignificant portion of the population opted for collaboration with the invaders and facilitated their occupation, the extraction of resources and crimes such as the deportation of French Jews. An equally small fraction of French citizens that grew in 1941 and 1942 rejected the occupation and joined the resistance, either outside, in which case they fought with the Free French Army, organized by Charles de Gaulle from London, or internally, trying to extract information about the enemy to sabotage railroads or facilities, and they either lived like before, but had these activities undercover or went into hiding. At this point, like any French citizen, Josephine Baker was faced with choices. Either stay neutral and wait, which is what the vast majority of people did, but it was complicated for artists and performers, because just by keeping doing their job, they contributed to normalize the situation and make the occupation acceptable in a sense. Many did that during the occupation and this left a stain on their career. Those who opted to collaborate were 
generally from the far right in the 1930s, and they did so either out of opportunism or because they welcomed the fall of the Republic and uh, the parliamentary democracy that they wanted to replace with a fascist regime based on the models of Italy or Germany. And finally, among the uh, other minority, the resistance, there were plenty of different profiles. Some were right-wing nationalists and uh, did not accept the uh, humiliation of a defeat. Some were politically moderate citizens who were brave enough to risk their lives for what they believed in. Charles de Gaulle fell in between these two categories. There were also many communists in the resistance. Not so much in 1940, because Germany and the USSR had a pact. But once Hitler attacked Stalin in 1941, many communists joined the resistance and they represented about half of it from 1942. Josephine Baker was not much into politics, and being a black American woman who had taken French citizenship three years earlier, she could have considered this war was not hers, and waited in the castle she and her husband owned in the south of France, or she could have emigrated to a neutral country, but this was not how she was. Instead, she stood for the country she had adopted and literally risked everything to fight for it. This was a, a brave decision to make in 1940 or 1941, when Germany was apparently winning everywhere. The truth is, few had the courage to risk their lives for a cause that didn't look anywhere near victory at this point in the war, but she was one of them, and this reveals a level of courage and uh, integrity that is certainly worthy of admiration. Josephine Baker is still popular in France nowadays, and if you want to understand why, look no further. It is not only appreciation for the performer, it is gratitude for being brave enough to stand for her country and show her honorable way out. The fact that she was born somewhere else and was French by adoption, by choice, makes her example even more powerful. Of course, from her point of view, there was something emotional in this commitment. She had had her breakthrough in Paris. At this point, she had spent almost half of her life in France, and she felt like she was giving back. So what did she do for the resistance? She spied. She housed people who wanted to join the Free French Forces on their way out of France. She carried information to about airfields, harbors or troops, sometimes with notes written in invisible ink on music sheets. She had the advantage, as an entertainer, of having an excuse to travel to neutral countries. She went to Portugal and South America which helped transmit information to the Allies. All this was very risky business. If caught, she would have been quickly executed, like many resistance were. Later, in 1941, she went to the French colonies in North Africa. She was based in Morocco and transmitted information during tours in Spain on notes that she pinned inside her underwear. Her status as a celebrity spared her a strip search, so that was a good way to carry information. 
However, in Morocco she fell seriously ill. She had a miscarriage and then developed a very severe infection which required a long recovery. After that, she didn't return to France immediately, but she dropped her cover as a, a neutral entertainer and started touring in North Africa to uh, entertain the growing number of American, British and French soldiers in the region. She remained active like, uh, like this, supporting Allied troops as much as she could for the remainder of the war. After the war ended in 1945, Josephine Baker's image had uh, changed dramatically, especially in France. She was no longer just uh, a likable and gifted performer. She was also a war hero now. But she returned to the stage in uh, 1949, aged 43 at this point, with a more serious act that once again was very successful. And right after that, she could plan uh, a comeback to the US, and this time this comeback was successful. In 1951 and 1952, she engaged on uh, a national tour in America to uh, numerous audiences and good reviews. Her trip back culminated in a parade in Harlem in front of a hundred thousand people. During this tour, she morphed once again, this time into a civil rights activist in the US. She engaged in a public battle over desegregating the audience at a club where she performed in Miami and she made it clear that she supported the civil rights movement that was taking off in the 1950s. In 1963, 13 years later, she spoke alongside Martin Luther King at the March on Washington. And she kept performing in the, the 1950s and 1960s, She's still based in France, but traveling the world. However, she also went into financial trouble in the 1960s. Managing her budget was not one of her talents, and she maintained an expensive lifestyle. She lost her castle in the south of France due to financial issues, and she struggled to support her family. Because during the post-war period, she became an adoptive mother to a lot of kids, ten boys and two girls. Josephine Baker, as a mother, raised eyebrows. She adopted kids from all sorts of backgrounds and skin colors, but made plans for each of them. She chose to raise them in different religions and even made plans for their future lives and their future careers that the kids were not supposed to question. Many of them revolted against their mother, and one of her sons later said that she was more interested in having like a dollhouse of real children than actually raising free and independent individuals that would be able to choose a life for themselves. In 1975, she starred in a retrospective review celebrating her 50 years of career in France. At this point, she had declined as a performer. She often forgot lyrics, and her speeches between songs could turn into rambling. But she was still able to attract crowds, and in her last audience were artists like Mick Jagger or Diana Ross. Four days after this last show, she was found lying in her bed, surrounded by newspapers with good reviews of her show. She had fallen in a coma, 
and she died in a hospital shortly after, aged 68. And now we are back to this day of April 1975 and her spectacular funeral in Paris. Josephine Baker, the entertainer, the war hero, the activist, the stage legend was gone. She remains well known and very much appreciated in France and in the rest of the world for all she did and what she was, talented but also smart, brave, idealistic and generous. Now let's move to our second story of the night. Josephine Baker was a spy for a short time, and this was just an aspect among others in her life. But our next character is the embodiment of a spy and an adventurer, and is sometimes even credited for inspiring James Bond. We're going to go back in time, in imperial and then communist Russia, and explore the life of Sidney Rayleigh. As a, a historical figure, Rayleigh is well known, and his global fame started in the 1930s, a few years after his death. But many aspects of his life, including where he came from, remain mysterious, but after all that sounds appropriate for the Ace of Spies. He himself told several versions of his background. He sometimes claimed to be the son of an Irish merchant, or a Russian aristocrat, or a Jewish doctor. We don't even know his birth name. What we can be sure of is that he was born in the 1870s, without more precision, and in Russia. According to records from the political police of the Xars, the Okhrana, he was arrested in 1892, aged probably 17 to 20, for being a member of a revolutionary group but he was quickly released, and there are reasons to think he could have worked as an informant at a very young age for the Okrana. It sometimes goes unnoticed in historical novels or movies about the last Xars, who are often presented in a more glamorous way, but at the end of the 19th century, and until the revolution, in 1917, the regime in Russia was extremely violent and repressive. The political police was feared and had very extended powers to arrest and interrogate people, even sometimes to make them disappear. At a time when in Western Europe or in the United States, parliamentary democracies were in place, or even when the regime was authoritarian, like in Germany, there was a parliament with powers, and a set of rights was guaranteed for every citizen. Russia was still very much an autocracy, and the rule of law did not protect anyone who expressed opinions that could go against the established order. There was no such thing as a right to free speech or the right of reunion. The judiciary was under control when it came to politics. Censorship was everywhere and any sign of revolutionary activity was swiftly repressed. The threat to the regime did not only come from socialists like the ones that later took control of the revolution, liberals who wanted 
just more rights and freedom were also at risk, even though they did not necessarily call for regime change in Russia. It's actually not the communist regime that invented deportation to Siberia and the ancestor of the Gulag. All of this already existed for criminals and political opponents under the Xars. In any case, shortly after these contacts with the Okrana, the political police, Rayleigh escaped Russia. He faked his death, probably to disappear, and stowed away aboard a British ship bound for South America. He landed in Brazil, adopted the name of Pedro, and uh, lived off small jobs like plantation worker or cook. And as a cook, he accompanied a British expedition in 1895. He must have been about 20 at this point, and uh, allegedly saved the expedition and its leader from an attack by the natives. He was rewarded with a a British passport for this and a boat ticket to Britain. He was now British and adopted the name Sidney Rosenblum. Or so he said, because the entire episode with heroic action against the natives in the Amazonian forest is questioned and could be a mere fabrication. Contradictory evidence indicates that he arrived to Britain not from Brazil, but from France, with a a big sum of money that he would have uh, stolen to uh, Italian revolutionaries with an accomplice. The uh, Italians were found uh, knived, and one of them had his throat cut. In these years, whether he went to uh, South America or not, he had a relationship with a young Anglo-Irish woman, Ethel Lillian Bull, who was a writer and was active in Russian circles outside Russia. She published a novel in 1897 called The Gadfly that was successful and drew a lot of inspiration from Rayleigh's life or maybe Rayleigh's stories about his life. Ethel Lillian Bull was close to revolutionary circles outside Russia. And there is some question of whether Rayleigh was really invested in their relationship or if he faked it a little because he was spying on these same circles for the Russian police. We don't know. But it is well documented that by the last years of the 1890s, so he was now in his late twenties, he lived in an apartment block in London. He created a small business, but also worked as an informant for a branch of Scotland Yard. This branch was headed by a man called William Melville, who later oversaw a special section of the British Secret Service Bureau, the ancestor of the MI6, the British Secret Intelligence Service. Rayleigh had no personal fortune at this point, but he quickly found a way to acquire one, maybe criminally. He met a wealthy reverend through his business and was introduced to his younger wife. The two started having an affair. A few months later, the reverend changed his will and made his wife the executor, should he die. And one week later, bad luck, he was found dead and a mysterious doctor appeared to certify that his death was due to influenza and that no investigation was needed. 
Records indicate there was no doctor by the name this one said he had, and his physical description matched that of Rayleigh. The nurse hired by the reverend's wife was not investigated, even though she had previously been involved in an arsenic poisoning. The doctor looking like Rayleigh was uh, not investigated neither, and never reappeared. The wife insisted that her husband's body be buried quickly after death, and she inherited 800,000 pounds, which was a small fortune in 1898. Four months later, the young widow and Rayleigh got married. There is obviously a high probability that he conspired with uh, his lover and uh, future wife to get rid of the reverend and uh, seize his money. But given that there was no investigation, nothing was proved. It also seems the lack of zeal by the police was related to his work for the intelligence service. When he got married, he crafted, with the help of William Melville, a completely new identity, that of Sidney George Rayleigh, the name under which we know him, even though it was invented. This easy identity change was certainly helped by the intelligence service to send him back to Russia undercover. In 1899, seven years after leaving Russia for South America, maybe, he was back to St. Petersburg with a wife and a British passport. Of course he was supposed to work for the UK, but in St. Petersburg he was approached by a Japanese general who needed agents in Russia as the tensions between the two countries were mounting in the Far East, and the war was uh, about to start. Rayleigh was offered money for collecting information about the positioning of Russian troops in the Far East. So he became a double agent, obviously without telling any of his employers. By the end of the 19th century, Britain and Russia were officially uh, in good terms. A few years later, they would even form an alliance. At this point in 1899, the main ally of Russia on the continent was France, that tried to circle Germany and Austria-Hungary while securing an alliance with Britain. The treaty called the Entente Cordiale was signed in 1904 between France and the UK, and actually still remains in place today. And a few years later, Russia joined, forming one of the two alliances that would fight in the First World War. But it doesn't mean the interests of Britain and Russia were perfectly aligned. In particular, there was the issue of Central Asia, at this time, the British Empire was at the peak of its influence and power. It reached its maximum extension later, in the 1920s, but in the second half of the 19th century, its relative power was uh, unrivaled. And being present on every continent, with numerous interests everywhere, Britain maintained a huge network of diplomats, spies and informants around the world. The region where Britain and Russia faced each other was Central Asia. Russia came from the north, from Siberia, and Britain from the south, from India. The game of influence to dominate the region and its resources lasted for a long time and is called the Great Game. Each power deployed informants or tried intimidation towards local rulers to extend its influence. 
So, under cover, Rayleigh was sent to the Caucasus, a Russian territory back then, to gather information about natural resources in Central Asia. And uh, the memoir he sent to British intelligence was apparently considered valuable because he was paid for it. But he also worked for Japan, and maybe more than anything, for himself. Shortly after his trip to the Caucasus, he reappeared in Port Arthur, Manchuria. Port Arthur was a Russian city under a direct threat from a Japanese invasion. And in fact, this is what happened with the Russian-Japanese War of 1904-1905. In 1904, he allegedly stole, with the help of a Chinese engineer, the defense plans of the Port Arthur Harbor, which may have helped the Japanese Navy navigate by night through minefields and launch a surprise attack in February 1904. The Japanese half failed at this surprise attack they captured Port Arthur, but with uh, heavier losses than the Russians. But Rayleigh had done his part of the job at least. And at the same time, he made a fortune for himself as a war profiteer, purchasing and reselling huge amounts of food, medicine and coal to the Russian defenders. His activity in Port Arthur became suspicious and he discovered that one of his business subordinates was actually working for Russian counterintelligence which decided him to leave Russia for now and travel to Imperial Japan to uh, collect the price of his spying before and during the Russo-Japanese war. He didn't stay long as a uh, he quickly reappeared in 1905 in Paris. He was not a famous figure, of course, being constantly undercover and uh, hiding behind various identities. But his work for the British and the Japanese had attracted attention in the intelligence communities of various great powers, and his services began to be sought after. He was now in his early thirties, and uh, he already embodied the confident international adventurer that you would expect to find in a novel. He spoke several languages fluently, could be comfortable undercover in very different social circles. He had started to collect relationships with women too. This was perfect to create a, a romantic and a fascinating persona, but didn't go without criticism in the uh, intelligence community. He acquired a reputation for being a bit reckless, taking uh, unnecessary risks and uh, indulging into other activities that were not entirely professional for a spy. In Paris, Rayleigh reunited with his British employer, William Melville. Melville used Rayleigh in an incident that became later known as the Darcy Affair. This is a bit hypothetical because it isn't clear whether it was Rayleigh or another agent that intervened in this plot. The story is about oil fields. In the first years of the 20th century, ships, and in particular warships, were beginning to transition from steam and coal-powered engines to oil propulsion. In 1904, the British Admiralty projected that petroleum would become the main source of fuel for the Royal Navy and this gave a strategic importance to securing oil fields. 
the Admiralty learned that an Australian engineer, William Knox Darcy, had secured rights to a big concession where oil fields could be exploited in the south of Persia, Iran nowadays, and Darcy was also negotiating similar rights with the Ottomans in Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. William Knox Darcy is famous for founding the Anglo-Persian Oil Company that later became one of the antecedents of British Petroleum, BP. And Darcy was negotiating with the French branch of the Rothschild family to resell these rights. The French Rothschilds were very well connected with the Parisian establishment. They were on the board of the French Central Bank and their buying of these concessions would have left one of the most promising oil producing fields in the world into foreign hands. So Rayleigh would have been sent to the south of France in Cannes to locate Darcy and tell him that the British would top any deal he would get from the Rothschilds. Rayleigh would have attired himself as a, a Catholic priest looking for donations for a charity to gate crash the discussions on board the Rothschild's yacht and uh, to secretly inform Darcy that he would better quickly end the negotiations. And in fact, Darcy's rights ended in British hands. Even though Rayleigh's involvement in this story is still discussed, it is documented that he stayed on the French Riviera about at the same time, at a location very close to the Rothschild's yacht. Returning from the south of France, Rayleigh stayed for a short time in Brussels and then headed back to St. Petersburg. His next mission would have taken him to Germany in 1909. At this point, tensions had escalated further between European powers and the arms race in Germany, Russia, Britain and France was constantly accelerating. Britain was particularly worried about German weaponry, of which it had little knowledge. Rayleigh would have been sent to Germany to obtain plans and he would have landed at the Krupp Gunworks undercover as a Baltic shipyard worker. The Krupp company was a steel engineering and weapons manufacturer specializing in heavy guns in particular. Rayleigh would have managed to infiltrate the offices and steel plants, but he would have been surprised after strangling a guard and he would have had to escape to a safe house before being exfiltrated. From this safe house, the legend says he tiered the plants into four pieces and mailed them uh, separately to Britain so that if one was lost, the other three would still reveal the main lines of the plans. Rayleigh was back again in St. Petersburg, Russia, in 1912, this time assuming the role of a wealthy businessman. He may have started to work again as a double agent, this time no longer for Japan, but for the Russian Okrana, the political police. This switch of allegiance shows that Rayleigh was certainly not working for ideals, like uh, other spies did. If you remember Richard Zorge, I told you about in a previous story. He worked for money first, and uh, beyond money, maybe for the challenge, the thrill of having an adventurous life. But he didn't stay long in Russia and probably spent most of World War I in the United States. 
he made business there. At the beginning of the war, he arranged weapon sales to the Germans and to the Russians using his connections, apparently no longer employed by the British government. But this source of income disappeared when the US entered the war in 1917 and the Russian Revolution occurred the same year, which would have pushed him to resume contacts with the British government while he lived in New York City. In 1917-1918, Britain and the US were allied, but spying between allies was a common thing, and there was a British delegation in New York City officially sent to coordinate between the two governments in regards to intelligence. And this delegation also focused upon obtaining trade secrets and uh, all sorts of information that could benefit British industrial companies. Via Canada, Rayleigh was then sent back to Russia again in the month following the revolution. He arrived in April 1918, and Russia was nothing like what he had known before. The Tsar was gone, the Bolsheviks had taken control of the revolution, and Russia had signed peace with Germany, withdrawing from the war. But it was now in a civil war between factions. The Bolsheviks under Lenin trying to take control of the entire country against various armies of generals who remained loyal to the old order, the whites, as they were called, against the reds, the communists. Russia was in a state of complete chaos, and all foreign powers wanted to know what was going on. They also very much hoped that the Bolsheviks would lose the civil war, and Britain or France supported the whites with funding and equipment. But they were still engaged against Germany, and their priority couldn't be to intervene in Russia for the best part of 1918. Rayleigh really assumed the role of a Bolshevik sympathizer which he certainly wasn't. He reactivated old connections and he obtained a travel permit in the country as a Cheka agent. The Cheka was the successor to the Okrana and it later grew dramatically and became the KGB. Rayleigh's most daring exploit was yet to come even though it did not succeed. An attempt to assassinate Lenin and uh, depose the Bolshevik government. This episode is known as the Ambassador's Plot. Rayleigh's real role in these uh, events is very unclear. We don't even know for sure for which side he worked, if any. But in uh, 1918, Efforts in Russia to convince the Soviets of resuming the war against Germany had failed, and the priority of British, American and French agents in Russia became to overthrow the Bolsheviks. One, because they were an obstacle to Russia re-entering the war, and two, because none of these countries wanted a socialist power to succeed. In May 1918, agents, including Rayleigh, met with the head of one of the counter-revolutionary organizations in order to see how they could collaborate to kick the Bolsheviks out of power, either by providing equipment to anti-Bolshevik armies or fomenting revolts in cities. With help from Rayleigh, a coalition of Allied agents allegedly planned a coup against the Bolsheviks. With the help of bribed Bolshevik leaders, they would capture or kill 
Lenin and Trotsky. They believed the elimination of these two leaders would end the Bolshevik Revolution. In July and August 1918, preparations for the coup advanced and the Allied conspirators met several times in Moscow. They had organized a broad network of agents, of saboteurs, who would disrupt food supplies. A military uprising was planned in Moscow, and they thought food shortage, plus the capture of Lenin, would trigger massive popular unrest that would wipe out the Bolsheviks. At the same time, in August 1918, an Allied expedition called Operation Archangel landed in the port of Arkhangelsk in the north of Russia, with British and French soldiers who would help the counter-revolutionary armies. All along the process, Rayleigh was able to travel between Moscow and St. Petersburg, renamed Petrograd, under his cover as a Cheka agent. But the plan unraveled. Lenin and Trotsky were supposed to meet on 30 August 1918, and this was the moment chosen by the Allies to send the bribed soldiers capture them. But the meeting never took place, because Lenin was the target of another assassination attempt the same day. He was shot by a former anarchist, and the meeting was postponed. Even though seriously injured, Lenin survived and even gained a boost in popularity from it. After this assassination attempt, the Cheka launched a huge reprisal campaign known as the Red Terror against all foreigners malcontents and political opponents. Mass executions took place, and this effectively ruined the plans prepared by the conspirators. Several key figures of the ambassador's plot were arrested, embassies were raided in violation of their traditional safety, and the press, especially the Pravda, the newspaper of the Leninist regime, published a lot of articles about the aborted coup. They denounced the Anglo-French bandits. Rayleigh escaped and was hunted like never before, but under another identity, he managed to escape through Finland and reach Stockholm in Sweden, from where he could return to England. He was tried in his absence in Moscow, together with many foreign agents, and sentenced to death. The sentence was to be carried out immediately, should he be caught on Soviet soil. It didn't stop Rayleigh from returning. In 1918 and 1919, Russia remained in civil war, and it was easy for foreign agents to enter given the very chaotic situation. He returned as a British trade delegate to uncover information about the Black Sea coast in the south of Russia. In 1922, he met his last wife in Berlin. She was an actress and a dancer. Their union would last only 30 months as Rayleigh later disappeared in Russia and was finally executed by the Soviets. Rayleigh fell into a trap this time. He was lured into Russia by the OGPU, a successor to the Cheka, allegedly to help an anti-Bolshevik organization called the Trust in 1925. The Trust never existed as an organization. It was a counter-espionage deception created by Soviet counterintelligence 
to identify and capture foreign agents really fell into the trap as soon as he crossed the frontier supposedly to secretly meet anti-communist revolutionaries he was arrested and transported to be interrogated the soviets claimed he had been shot crossing the frontier while interrogating him no one knows for sure what happened next whether he was tortured and what information he gave or didn't give to the OGPU but he was taken to a forest near Moscow on November 5, 1925 and executed this we now know but in the years following his execution there were rumors that he had survived and that this was just another cover or that he had in fact defected to the Soviet Union in a matter of years the man became a legend his name appeared in the press and turned into a household name the name of a masterful spy and adventurer which he certainly was even though there is still a lot of mystery surrounding his involvement in many of the plots, twists and turns we just talked about. Rayleigh inspired novels, movies and especially Fleming in the 1950s and 1960s to create the character of James Bond, a spy who was also a womanizer, an action man when needed, someone who lived a fancy lifestyle and uh, appreciated elegance. The man also probably killed a lot, and uh, not just on missions, as uh, exemplified by his London marriage with the widow of one of his likely victims. He was certainly greedy, selfish, and maybe not as charming as James Bond as a person. But still, it is hard not to be amazed at the number of important events he was uh, evolved in and uh, how he turned his life into an extraordinary novel. So I'm done for today. As always, I hope you liked these two stories and I will talk to you soon for another adventure. Sleep well. Au revoir.